Pauline Kael, film critic, The New Yorker. The first violence I had ever seen was along the Embarcadero. The anger of the men. I never saw it again until recently in Philadelphia, between cops and little Negro kids. Angry men were yelling. They had weapons and were angry at other men. I was in a car with my father. I had seen passive red lines, but this was different. Girls don't usually see this, particularly if you're a bookish girl from a bookish family. It may have been a prelude to the San Francisco general strike. I'm not sure. That was almost like a blackout. It had a sense of paralysis. The kids with lots of money had actually been moved to the peninsula out of harm's way. The rich people thought there was going to be a revolution, and they moved out of town. My neighbors were angry with my mother because she fed hungry men at the back door. They said it would bring others, and then what would she do? She said, I will feed them till the food runs out. It wasn't until years later I realized the fear people had of these men. We didn't have it in our house. I understand why these neighbors were afraid. They had lived with domestic violence all their lives. They were beaten up by their husbands every Saturday night. You could hear them screaming. So their fear of men was generalized. I'm sure my father never hit my mother. Ours was a non-violent family, so we weren't particularly scared of these strange men. Kitty McCullough. I'm 71 and I still swim. There were many beggars who would come to your back door and they would say they were hungry. I didn't give them my money because I didn't have it, but I did take them in and put them in my kitchen and gave them something to eat. This one man came in, it was right before Christmas. My husband had a very nice suit, tailored. It was a black suit with a fine white pinstripe in it. He put it to one side. I thought he didn't like the suit. I said to this man, your clothes are all ragged. I think I have a nice suit for you. So I gave him the suit. The following Sunday, my husband was to go to awake. He said, where's my good suit? And I said, well, daddy, you never wore it. I, well, it's gone. He said, where's it gone to? I said, I gave it to a man who had such shabby clothes. Anyway, you got three other suits and he didn't have any. So I gave it to him. He said, you're the limit, mother. One elderly man that had white whiskers and all, he came to my back door. He was pretty much of a philosopher. He was just charming. A man probably in his 60s. And he did look like St. Nicholas, I'll tell you that. I gave him a good warm meal. He said, bring me a pencil and paper and I'll draw you a picture. So we sketched. And he was really good. He was an artist. <laughs> a man came to my door and I could smell liquor a little. He said, you don't suppose you could have a couple of shirts you could give me old shirts of your husband's? I said, oh, I'm so very sorry my husband hasn't anything but old shirts really. That's all he has right now, and he wears those. He said, Lady, if I get some extra ones, I'll come back and get them to you. I said, Go on, mind your own business. And another one, I smelled liquor on his breath too. He wanted to know if he could have a few pennies. I said, Are you hungry? He said, I haven't had any food. I'd like some money to buy some food. I said, I'll make you a nice sandwich. So I made him a sandwich with mayonnaise and chicken and lettuce, a double sandwich, put it in wax paper. He gave me a dirty look and he started down the street. I watched him when he got, oh, three, two or three, four doors down and he threw it in the street. Dawn, Kitty's daughter. I remember that our apartment was marked. They had a mark. An actual chalk mark or something. You could see these marks on the bricks near the back door. One mark signified, 
You could get something at this apartment, buddy. But you can't get anything up there. We'd be out in the alley playing, and we'd hear comments from people, Here's one. They wouldn't go to the neighbors upstairs, because they didn't give them anything. But ours was marked. They'd come out from Chicago, and they'd hit our apartment, and they knew they'd get something. Whatever the mark meant, some of them were like an X. They said, you can't get money out of this place, but there's food here anyway. My mother was hospitable to people. It didn't matter who they were. Emma Tiller. At the time, she lived and worked in Western Texas as a cook. When tramps and hobos would come to their door for food, the southern white people would drive him away. But if a negro come, they will feed him. They'll even give them money. They'll ask them, do you smoke? Do you dip snuff? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. They was always nice in a nasty way to negroes. But their own color, they wouldn't do that for him. They would hire negroes for these types of jobs where they wouldn't hire whites. They wouldn't hire a white woman to do housework because they were afraid she'd take her husband. When the Negro woman said, Ms. So-and-so, we got some cold food in the kitchen left from lunch. Why don't you give it to him? She'll say, oh no, don't give him nothing. He'll be back tomorrow with a gang of them. He ought to get a job and work. The Negro woman who worked for the white woman would take food and wrap it in newspapers. Sometimes we would hurry down the alley and holler at him, Hey, mister, come here. And we'd say, Come back. Come by after a while, and I'll put some food in a bag, and I'll sit down inside the garbage can so they won't see it. Then he'd get food, and we'd swipe a bar of soap and a face razor or something and stick it in there for him. Negroes would always feed these tramps. Sometimes we would see him on the railroad tracks picking up stuff, and we would tell him, Come to our house. They would come by, and we would give him an old shirt, or a pair of pants, or some old shoes. We would always give him food. Many times I have gone in my house and taken my husband's old shoes. Some of them he needed himself, but that other man was in worse shape than he was. Regardless of whether it was Negro or white, we would give it to him. We would gather stuff out in the field, pull our corn, roast deniers, and put them in a cloth bag because a paper bag would tear. When they get hungry, they can stop and build a fire and roast this corn. We did that ourselves, we loved it like that. And give them salt and stuff, we figured would last them until he gets to the next place. <laughs> and talk. And tell us their hard luck story. Whether it was true or not, we never questioned it. It's very important you learn people as people are. Anybody can go around and write a book about a person. But that book doesn't always tell you that person, really. At that particular moment when you are talking to that person, maybe that's how a person were. Tomorrow, they can be different people. It's very important to see people as people and not try to see them through a book. Experience and age give you this. There's an awful lot of people that house un outstanding educations. But when it comes down to common sense about people, they really don't know.